so we know how important garbage collection is for any programming language out there in this video we understand why a programming language needs an automatic garbage collection in the first place right we start with the basics of memory management then we look at the constructs that language provides us to do a uh, basic garbage collection and why that is unreliable in the first place and that leads to the need of programming language having a way to do automatic garbage collection right so we start with memory management at first and we go along the entire journey right so any and every program that you write needs memory to work right so you assign a variable you declare a variable int a equal to 10 this variable needs its space so that you can store value you you, you can store value in that variable you can modify the value in that variable and do that stateful things that you always wanted to do like so summation of numbers multiplication of numbers updating a variable updating the value within a struct and all so every single thing that you do every single program that runs requires some memory to work on so that's where you declare variables to do your job right so the job could be you building a game you're doing accounting you're doing normal chat all of the the objects that you see on the screen they're all allocated somewhere in the memory right then only are able to see it otherwise you otherwise that would not be functional right so every object that we see on the screen or the variable we use are allocated somewhere in the memory there are two possible places where these variables are allocated first is stack second is heap right so heap is where the major part of garbage collection lies because stack is automatically garbage collected so we'll spend a few minutes understanding the stack part and then we'll move into the heap part because that's where the entire discussion would flow in so whenever you allocate a variable let's say in a equal to 10 it first gets allocated onto like not first but uh, in the function scope when you do in a equal to 10 the variable gets allocated in the stack frame of the function when the when that this function invokes another function it adds a new stack frame on top of the stack right and then the variable on those functions are defined there and these are local variables that's where when a function returns the stack is popped as soon as the stack is popped the variable loses its relevance because the variable does not really exist so that's where you do not really need an explicit garbage collection for variables that are allocated on stack but you definitely need garbage collection where your variables are allocated in the second part of storage which is heap so what exactly is heap heap is everything which is non stack part of ram is the heap storage in the heap storage like what you can do is you can request your uh, languages runtime engine to allocate n bytes for your memory uh, for your object let's say i want to store 10 books in my in memory array right and the size of each book is let's say 100 bytes so i how much memory i want i want 1000 bytes of memory to represent 10 objects in the ram but allocating this much into stack might make your stack very big will make your stack very big and your program very inefficient because stack has a very limited size where it can grow that's what you do you allocate big objects onto heap when it comes to the heap part of it, you, uh, uh, this is a pretty standard way of allocating it to the heap. This is more like C, C++ way of doing it. But every language has its own construct. Depending on the language that you are using, you can see if it gets allocated onto stack or heap. Or if you want to allocate onto the heap, how you can do it. Right? This is a standard C way of doing it. You say that malloc, which is basically memory allocation. Like, please allocate me a memory of 10 into size of book. Size of book would return 100 for each uh, book. 100 into 10 is 1000. After this call, my uh, the runtime engine will allocate uh, 1000 bytes of ram or 1000 bytes of heap and will be referenced by books so books will contain the address to the starting location of that heap chunk right now that we are allocating it to the heap why why do we need to allocate to the heap because stack is local once the function is popped that the variable is gone the 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 data is lost so that's where Whenever you'd want to allocate big objects and pass it between functions and have a global allocation of it, you you'd always allocate that object onto the heap and pass the reference across the functions, right? So that it does not require you to pass it by value and pass a massive chunk of data across functions, right? So it makes passing of variables simple. Multiple functions can refer to that same variable location which is out there, right? So if two functions want to update the same variable, they are same object in memory, they would be able to do it. Right, so very efficient way of doing cross-function communication. Right, this is where heap comes in, comes in very handy. So that is why we need heap in the first place. So there are a few very important reasons why we need heap in the first place. Because you would say, hey, if I'm not using heap, I don't need garbage collection. So let's just get rid of heap. Right? No, but we need heap. Why? Reason number one: we can have objects that are too big or too too inefficient to be on stack. For example, the books example that we took, 
if we allocate 10 books, we require 100 bytes of memory. Adding that 100 bytes on top of a stack will make your stack grow faster and stack has a very limited memory after which you will get an error ki, hey, I cannot add more things to the stack. Your stack grow out of limit. Right? So you cannot, you do not want to add and plus anything you allocate onto the stack is local. As soon as a function is popped, the data is gone. Right? So we need, so those type of objects that wants to outlive the execution of your function, you allocate it onto the heap. Right? So either objects that are too big, you allocate it onto the heap or they're too inefficient to be on the stack, you allocate it onto the heap. Right? Second reason is you want dynamically growing objects like arrays, linked list, trees, they are classic example. Hey, you might start with just one node of linked list, but depending on what traction you are getting, you, are, you want to continuously add new nodes to it. You cannot do it on stack. You have to do it on heap. So dynamically you allocate a node and then you assign the pointer and then you link the pointer and you create a linked list. Same thing goes with tree. So anyway, when you need dynamically growing objects, they are mostly always allocated on heap. Right? Thirty, you want multiple functions to use the same instance of the object. As I just explained, you with the heap, because it's a central storage in RAM, you can pass in the reference across functions and two functions or let's say you have two threads on which the functions are executing on those two threads can simultaneously update the same object or simultaneously can access the same object. Right? So you don't need to pass this gigantic chunk of object across functions. Right? Plus they are all they are all coordinating on the same object. So better performance. And to not pass gigantic objects onto the function. This is one of the main reasons to do it. Right? So whenever objects are allocated on top of heap, they are always addressed by a reference, basically pointer. So address to that particular object. So it's, it will always be the starting offset of this particular object, which is typically referenced uh, by pointer. Right? So now the constructs that programming languages give you. So every programming language out there gives you a way to do explicit deallocation. So whenever you allocated something in the heap, programming languages will have a way for you to mark that object as like you to, phys to physically deallocate the object from the memory, allowing it to be reused by some other function. Right? For example, you had a particular chunk in your, let's say this is your heap and this is the object that you allocated and then you explicitly deallocated the object. Now this object or oh sorry, this memory location is now free for any other malloc to or any other function called to grab it. So it might be possible where some other thread is, is, is uh, basically it wants a memory chunk and it will get memory chunk starting from here, like some big, like uh, depending on what the request is. So now that it is free, it can be used by someone else to use their object. So once you know that, hey, and I don't need this, uh, I don't need this uh, memory chunk anymore, I would be deallocating it. So every programming language gives you a way of explicit deallocation, right? <clears throat> so standard example, talking in terms of C, C++, in C, C++, you have functions like free and delete that explicitly deallocates an object, allowing it to be reused by someone else, right? So once you are done, you invoke the free and the object is deleted, right? So it is good. It is actually good that programming languages provide a way to deallocate. But now what happens is someone has like your code has to trigger free and delete to deallocate it. Right. So you have to rely on your engineer or on your coding or on your best practices to ensure that the objects that you have allocated are always free. Right. And this is something that is very risky because engineers might forget to clean up uh, the objects that are allocated, right? Or they might write a code in which they think that the that they freed the object, but it is path of but it is part of a particular path. So unless this if path is not taken, the free is not invoked, right? So the object is not always deleted. Only in certain cases it is deleted. In some cases it is not, right? So it's very unpredictable if you hand it off to your engineers or to the engineers or to your code to do that cleanup. Right, where you have to do explicit deallocation. That is where, but what, what would happen if we don't deallocate, right? So like what, what could go wrong, <laughs> right? So what happens, first case, what happens if an object is not deleted and is not referenced by anyone? So object is just lying there. You get memory leak, right? So memory leak is a very critical condition of your program where you are allocating objects onto your heap, but not deallocating it. When you do that, because it's a memory leak, slowly and steadily, the memory consumption of your process would shoot up. And once it hits 100%, 
the end of once it hits hundred percent, and the process tries to allocate new memory. Let's say you trigger a new malloc. Would you want to allocate some memory? The process will crash because it could not allocate the memory. It will raise a panic. It will crash. So memory leak is a gigantic problem for any and every software out there. You will find tons of articles about it because it's a big, big, big problem. So <clears throat> always you need to ensure that. Whenever you are writing some code, when you are allocating things onto heap, if you don't need it, explicitly mark it for deallocation. Right? Otherwise, your process will crash. Your and then it would be restarted. And you will say, "Hey, what happened?" Obviously, you will get it in some exception or something. But it is always better to not let your process crash and give your user the best experience out there. Right? So slowly, like these blue boxes are the objects which are allocated but not referenced by anyone so they're just lying there so slowly and steadily the entire memory space the entire heap would be filled 100% allocation and when you try to malloc next it crashes right now another case is when what happens when an object is freed but it is still referenced like could happen right here if you are doing this explicit deallocation you are doing this free in this one path very high chance that you might be accessing this object again Right, so some other function might be accessing it as part of that some path. Right, so there is chance if you are <coughs> relying on your engineers to do it, or if you are relying on your explicit deallocation strategy, then there might be a case where the object you think that object is like one thread thinks that the object is there, another thread has already freed that object. Now what would happen? This is a classic case of a dangling pointer, where <coughs> let's say this yellow box is that object that exists and is still referenced. So everything is working fine for A. But this gray box was referenced by B, but then it was deallocated, right? <clears throat> and uh, sorry, uh, the uh, the object was deallocated, but B still has the reference to it. Like so, some some function is still accessing this object. And then what happened is that say some another thread came in and did a malloc, and the language runtime allocated this space. Now what is happening over here? Is that same space? Someone thinks that the object exists, but you deallocated. Some your language runtime allocated this location for some other thread to work on, or so the deallocation for another malloc that executed. So it put it its object here. So now what happens now? So this kind of situation is very unpredictable because the location that you are accessing does not exist anymore for you. For you, it does not exist anymore. Some other thread has already written something onto that particular location. So what you see, you see jargon value, you see garbage value, you see something which is your, your the program would be very unpredictable because either it would get the old value or it would get something random. It would get some random set of bytes which you don't know what they are. So dangling pointer is a major problem when. And the worst part is your program becomes unpredictable because you don't know how your program would behave. So the bugs that happen because of dangling pointer are the worst one to debug, because you'll see that in some cases it is working, in some cases it is not, in some cases program is crash crashing, in some cases it is not. So it would be very weird of a situation for you to even debug it, right? So in most cases when you have, when you face similar bugs, most common reason has to be a dangling pointer. Right? So the best case. <laughs> Not even kidding. The best case when you have a dangling pointer is that your process crashes. In most cases, your process actually do not crash because even if C has allocated or, or C is using this memory now, B would still get some data. It's not that B would not get any data. B would get some data over here, which B would try to interpret and do something about it. Some error, or, or it might be able to successfully read that data as well, and it the entire flow becomes in, uh, unpredictable here. So the best case that you would expect, like you would hope for, is if there is a dangling pointer, please, please, my process crash. Right? Otherwise, having an unpredictable behavior is the worst that could happen, because with that your data would become inconsistent. You would think, hey, the value I just set to 10, how is this value changing to 20 automatically? Because some other process is writing there. Right? You need to know that you think that variable exists. That variable does not exist for you because. You deallocated it, and some other thread is starting to use it. So unpredictable behavior is the worst kind of things that could happen. Now, because of these reasons, right, where doing an explicit deallocation is is good for writing uh, with, with respect to coding best practices, but with respect to human behavior, with respect to human uh, like 
you adding to human efforts to remember ki hey, i have to deallocate this object and all it's it's very tedious it's very tedious to do that and very unreliable per se so that's why every programming language out there needs a way to automatically do garbage collection so there are multiple algorithms to do it uh to do it like mark and sweep uh like for example reference counting and also there are there, there are tons of ways to identify if an object is in use or it is not how to do garbage collection old generation young generation uh concurrent marks so there are so many algorithms for the g1 garbage collection and what not right so we will we will be basically touching upon that in future videos in some future videos out there but this idea was like more like why do programming languages even need garbage collection in the first place so three critical reason because automatic garbage collections are more reliable because it's a code who is doing it and not the human so you would expect he everything would work fine reduces human efforts because we as engineers we don't have to put in that effort ki hey are this object was allocated now i want to deallocate you don't want to put that effort and not prone to human errors ki hey in one path i did free in another path i did not so dangling and memory leaks another path right and which is why every programming language run time gives you a way to do automatic garbage collection and this garbage collection algorithms are always tunable for a programming language every programming language has multiple types of garbage collections which you can pick one from which suits your use case better right amazing chala that's it for this video i hope you learned something new where like why why do we even need it in the first place now you can appreciate garbage collectors even more it's it's basically reducing our efforts into ensuring the every object we allocate we are freeing it garbage collection takes it, uh, it 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 basically takes care of that in behalf of us nice so if you guys like this video give this video a thumbs up if you guys like the channel give this channel a sub and i'll see you in the next one thanks a ton